Hi, I'm Darren, and welcome back to Level Up Double E Lab. Well, I'm down to the last few episodes remaining on my HF transmitter build, and one important topic to cover is the final power amplifier, and that's the subject for today's episode. So let's get to it. I already went through the final amp design and board layout back in episode number eight. But as a quick one sentence summary, I'm using a commonly built design based around two IRF 510 MOSFETs connected in push-pull mode. When supplied with 28 volts DC power, it's capable of between 10 and 30 watts output on the amateur HF bands. Now the layout is my own design that I sized around a heat sink that I had in the parts bin. Because it's likely that I'd need to remove and replace some of the components during trials, I had the bare board fabricated so I'd have sturdy plated through holes. Here it is all built up. There are three transformers and one choke that each require their own unique winding configurations, and one in particular is a bit tricky because it uses two FT50-43 cores. The output transformer is built on a chunky binocular core, and because of the power it handles, I use Teflon coated 20 gauge wire. I also used a dab of epoxy to glue it to the board so that the wires would not have to mechanically support it. The rest of the construction was pretty easy. Because the FETs need to be heat synced, even for just a few seconds of testing, I went ahead and attached the heat sink. I soldered the FET terminals after I put everything together, that way I minimized any strain on the FET solder joints. Sticky thermal pads are sandwiched between the FETs and the heat sink, and I also used nylon bushings to keep the number three attachment screws from touching the FET mounting tabs. With all that work done, it's time to get it to the lab and power it up for testing. All right, I'm in the lab and I'm holding the camera because there's a lot to look at here as I get things set up. But essentially, uh, for testing out the final power amplifier, I had to partially build it into the case. I had to get the power supplies mounted and a few other things. It was just going to be impractical to do it any other way. So it looks kind of ugly, but it works. And I've got a lot of my toys out here at my workbench. It's a, my workbench is 11 feet long and it's barely big enough to hold everything that I need here. So uh, let me walk through what I've got set up. So of course I got the dim bulb tester to carefully power up the, the, the unit for the first time. Using my HP signal generator for some of the initial testing, but I need more power later on as I'll explain why. So I've drafted the Kenwood into service along with some attenuators that I'll use to knock down uh, its lowest power to make it even lower for this testing. My homemade power meter, of course, I got the power tap as well on the output so I can monitor what that looks like on the power meter and on the spectrum analyzer. Also, we're using the 465 as just a regular scope so we can take a quick look at the output. Using two multimeters, uh, one in the background on top is monitoring the current that goes into the IRF 510 so I can watch for anything there that might be alarming. And then the key fleece monitoring the voltage coming out of my power meter so I can get a more accurate reading. And then also it's kind of a cross check. I've got my Drake uh, MN4 uh, tuner box. It's got a regular old analog meter on it that does a pretty decent job, so I can just cross-reference it to my homemade meter. So let me get the camera set here in front of the scope and start some of these measurements. For this first test, I've got the camera set up so we can see the oscilloscope and the power meter a little more closely. And this is set into plain oscilloscope mode. It's time domain. I don't have the spectrum analyzer connected to it, so it's just oscilloscope mode. Um, I've set the bias on the two IRF 510s to about 100 milliamps each, or 200 milliamps total. And I've got the signal input to the amp coming directly from the output of my HP signal generator. Now, the max output I can get from it is plus 17 dBm, which is one order of magnitude lower than my max uh, drive input for this amp. So I don't expect to see more than 2 or 3 watts coming out of it and I'll turn it on so we can see what it looks like and there we go. Now the signal doesn't look like a pure sine wave for several reasons, not the least of which is I don't have an output filter installed here. I'll shut it off. Um, I don't have the 7 megahertz or the 40 meter filter. I've got the blank put in so it's just straight through. So here I'll turn it back on. We're seeing all the harmonics that the amplifier is producing but no worries we're going to filter most of that out when I put the low pass filters in. And as you can see, I'll turn it on and off again over in the power meter. Yep, we're only kicking out two or three watts, so barely any power. But nonetheless, we can see qualitatively what the signal looks like. Now I'm gonna switch the signal generator over 
to 20 meters, so that's 14 megahertz, and there we go. See a higher frequency and some drop off in amplitude. And this little bit of shakiness, this is actually a bad horizontal position pot on my 465. It's finally starting to give out after a few decades, so that's not the, the signal bouncing back and forth. But we can see it's working. No bizarre uh, characteristics to the signal. And last one, I'll go to 21 megahertz for 15 meters and down a bit more, but still pretty acceptable signal. And that's about all I'd hope for from this measurement, just to see that the amplifier is working, that the current draw is not spiking up real high. Again, I'm monitoring it on my ammeter, and it's drawing right now about 430 milliamps. So that's up from the 200, and 200 milliamps uh, uh, idle. So that's about what I would expect as I turn it on and off here. So that's good. It's a, it's a good first test of the performance of the amp. I'm set up here for the second round of testing, and for this round I'm going to use the 2N5109RF preamp. If you recall from a prior episode or two, I had talked about an IRF510 version that I built and had some issues, so I just set it aside, and I'm just using that guy. Uh, it's connected up with its input coming from the signal generator, so I dialed down the HP signal generator level appropriately to provide the CW signal going into the preamp. The output of the preamp goes into the input of the final amp. The output of it routes over to the antenna module. And I did install the 40 meter low pass filter. I took out, well, I keep calling the shorting bar, it's just a dummy uh, filter that doesn't have any elements on it, it's just a direct throughput. So I took that off, put the actual filter on, and of course the output continues over to the dummy load and the Drake power meter to be able to measure the power. Now, a couple of issues became evident. I knew in pre-testing that I just wasn't going to get to plus 27 dBm before I ran, ran out of headroom on even the 2N5109. That's close, but it's several dB short. So that still limits how much power I can actually see out of the, uh, the final amp, even with that board. I ran some quick tests, and I saw another couple of issues. The uh, heat sink on here does get very warm very quickly. I can only energize it for about 10 seconds or so then shut it down and uh, let it cool off. And uh, by shutting it off, I mean I actually disconnect the 12 volt power from it. I don't have a bias control on it. Um, I knew that that was going to be a, a risk because I'm running that guy in class A operation. It's drawing about 115 milliamps whenever it's got B plus applied to it. It's dissipating about 1.2 watts. That's a lot to ask from this tiny heat sink and that's something that's, that's an issue. The other thing that's happening after it gets that hot is it starts to become unstable. I can actually see the power drop off and it'll start oscillating. I'll remove the RF signal from it and it'll oscillate for a few seconds at around 10 megahertz. So definitely doesn't like to be that hot. But nonetheless, I was able to get some decent results from it. I'm going to duplicate those here in a minute. I'll move the camera over uh, to the scope again so we can see it. It's just a lot of connecting wires and sequencing here. It's a little tricky to, to do it, but nonetheless, we'll take a look at it. I do have a solution in mind. It's basically going to be a third version of the RF preamp, and I'll talk more about that at the end of the episode, my thoughts on how to fix it permanently. But for now, it's good enough. I think it'll get me through the rest of the build and debunking and get the rest of the rig together and try it out. All right, I moved the camera back in front of the scope, and this time I do have it connected to the spectrum analyzer, so that's what we're seeing here. And of course the power meter over on the right, along with the dummy load in the back. So let me go ahead and connect the bias for the stages, and then inject a 40 meter signal. That's minus 18 dBm going into the preamp, and we're getting just over uh, somewhere between 10 and 15 watts output. And I'll turn it on and off here. We can see that's the, the primary signal right there. And there's no second, third, or fourth harmonics at all. So that filter is doing a very good job of not allowing any harmonics to get out of that final amp. Now this guy over here, that's just a spur in my spectrum analyzer I was never able to get rid of. And that, of course, is the zero spur. So that's the main item of interest. And like I say, we don't see any other harmonics there. For this last test, I needed to improvise a bit. I needed a source that I could get to reliably 500 milliwatts, and my Kenwood TS570S does have adjustable power output, which I can knock down to 5 watts. Now, 5 is still too much to put into that amp, so I've got my step attenuator connected in series with an additional 10 dB of drop before it goes into the final. And I have to be a little careful because that step attenuator is not meant to take a lot of power for very long, but for 10 seconds or so, it doesn't get that hot, so I think it'll be just fine. 
So let me put the camera once again over in front of the scope and let's take a look at what we got. All right, and for this final shot, uh, I've got the scope once again connected up to the spectrum analyzer. I'll turn on the Kenwood power. There's the single pip. There's no harmonics showing up and the MN4 is showing about 15 watts. Now, here I'll shut it back off here. Um, this is not terribly accurate. This is my homemade RF power meter. I know it's pretty accurate because I've checked it against uh, um, a known standard. And when I connect it up to the 40 dB power tap, I get a reading of about 20 watts. And I can't do this one and the uh, spectrum analyzer at the same time. They both use the same uh, power tap. But nonetheless, so this is showing about 20 watts out. And with the same meter, I measured about 450 milliwatts coming out of the Kenwood. So do the quick math. That's a gain of 16 and a half dB. That's really good. That's within a dB or so of what the LT spy simulation predicted. So 20 watts out on 7 uh, megahertz on 40 meters. I think I can live with that. I would have liked a little bit more power, but really what's the difference between 20 watts and 30 watts on uh, se uh, on 40 meters? It's not that significant. So but more, more importantly, I'm pleased that my first attempt at trying to make a power amp turned out very well, worked right out of the gate, no issues. At this point in the project, I could spend more time trying to squeeze a few more watts out of this final amplifier, and I do have some ideas of some things that I could modify and adjust, but I'm gonna resist that temptation and instead focus on finishing the build. On a project with this level of complexity, it's easy to find yourself chasing down everything that you don't find optimal, but the problem is, if you go down every single rabbit hole you'll find, you're likely to end up with shelffuls of never finished projects. So I'm going to resist that temptation with one exception. I did come up with a different idea. It's my third idea now of how to improve that RF preamplifier. And it does, on a simulation, fix both of the main issues, the excessive heat dissipation concern and the low level of power output. An obvious way to fix both of these issues is to change the final stage to operate in class AB mode instead of class A, and that's exactly what I've done here. That reduces the idle current to only a few milliamps while preserving good linearity, and it splits the power dissipation across two transistors instead of just one. I'm showing a pair of 2N2222s here, but I may change that after I rummage through the junk box and see if I've got a couple of appropriate candidates in a larger TO39 case. They'll still need heat sinks, but there's considerably less power to dissipate, and there's essentially no heat loss when idling. The preceding two stages are conventional feedback amplifiers using 2N3904s, and they operate in Class A mode, which is fine because their power dissipation is really low. Other than a couple of tweaks I've made, the circuit is identical to those stages on the existing amp. And all three stages come from similar reference designs that I found in various sources. I'm just combining them in my own way. Simulation results look very promising, better than the first two designs. I'm getting a solid 50 dB of gain out of it just before distortion starts. That takes my minus 20 dBm input up to plus 30 dBm, or a full watt, which is twice what I need, so it does have some headroom. Taking a sneak peek into the future, I have ordered and have now received the bare boards for this design, so hopefully the third time is a charm for my attempt at making an RF preamplifier. That'll be an episode I'll squeeze in um, between the software, the debugging, and the final get it on the air and try it out episodes. As always, I thank you very much for watching this series and for watching my channel. I do hope you're enjoying this material, and if you do have questions, you know the usual request, leave them in the comment section below. So until next time, bye for now.